Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of joy, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is January the 4th in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, and today we find ourselves in Romans chapter 12. Now, if you read the New Testament consistently, and, and even the Bible for that matter consistently, there are passages that you have to work through. But then there are other passages where it's almost as if you were a pitcher and you take the cap off and the blessings of God just pour within you, filling you and thrilling you, blessing you and causing your heart much rejoicing. Well, that's what Romans chapter 12 is. In the daily life of the application of a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, there probably isn't a greater chapter than that of Romans chapter 12. And I think you'll discover that for yourselves by the time we finish with the study in this chapter. And so let's begin at verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. Now Paul says, I beseech you, therefore brethren. Now this tells us that Paul is writing to Christians because he calls them brethren. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, based upon everything that has been said up until this point, I beg of you, I plead with you, by the mercies of God, considering what God has done for you, considering the ultimate act of compassion by taking all of the wrath that you deserved for your disobedience and your rebellion and pouring it on the Lord Jesus, if you consider that, how your life has truly been saved and the mercy that has been shown to you in such a sacrifice, by that very mercy, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, if you were to present yourself to your king and you imagine in your mind your king sitting upon the throne and you walk into his great hall with your gift, you would probably see yourself bowing humbly before him, recognizing all the authority that is held within his kingship, all of the honor, glory, and dignity that is contained within his office, seeing yourself so much below that, and he being king, there is nothing that you can truly offer him that he doesn't already have or that would benefit him in his kingship. And yet, as you bow low before him and offer him your humble gift, that is the presentation that this verse is speaking of. With the same humility, the same recognition of who he is and who you are, that you will present your bodies. Not a gift as you and I would think it, but that we would present our very bodies, a living sacrifice unto him. Now, as we are already using our imaginations, when we think of a sacrifice, we may think of someone who is bound, someone who is restrained, lying flat, prostrate upon an altar, ready to give themselves to a higher purpose, for a higher cause. And that's what the Holy Spirit through Paul is saying here, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. And we do this by living holy, by living pure, by living separated from the world that we live in. And this is acceptable unto God. It is our reasonable service. So in making our bodies a living sacrifice, we are not to be conformed to this world. We are to resist the pleasures of this world, the things of this world. And that's why it's called a sacrifice. And he says if you're going to do this successfully, then you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to see things differently. You have to see all that this world has to offer behind the curtain lies much danger. And so you have to see this world through the eyes of God, not through your own eyes, because your own eyes are filled with a lust and a desire to pursue the things of this world. But through the eyes of God, we learn to detest and abhor the things of this world. 
And so we are to reconstruct the way that we see things, the way we think about things. And Paul tells us how to do this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. He says we are to cast down imaginations. These would be idle thoughts, things that we find ourselves thinking on when we don't even realize that we're thinking at all. Some would call these daydreams, but we're to be very alert of what our mind thinks on and rein in these thoughts and not allow them to run away from us. He says not only cast down imaginations, but he says cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, we learn the knowledge of God through the word of God. And so anything that is in opposition to the word of God, anything that attacks the word of God, anything that contradicts the word of God, we are to cast down. We're not to allow ourselves to think on these things. And friends, as you may be beginning to see, this requires and will require a great amount of effort on your part. But this is what we as his followers are being commanded to do. And we are to take into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are to be the police officers of our own lives, realizing that the old man that still lives in the flesh is a criminal And as the police officers of our lives, we are to apprehend that criminal and hold him captive, keep him bound in prison, in captivity, so that every thought we have is in obedience to Jesus. And that's why he says in verse 6, we are to be ready at all times to revenge all disobedience, to take that old man represented as a criminal put shackles upon his hands and his legs, throw him into a dark prison cell, offering him no way of escape. And this is how, back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we are to be transformed and how we are to renew our minds. And so when he reminds us of how much he likes of something that this world has to offer us, we remind him that we no longer think like that. We no longer act like that. We no longer do that. We no longer watch that. We no longer listen to that. We no longer read that. And if we do this enough, if we do this consistently, we are reprogramming our minds to how we think about things and how we see things. And in doing this, we are proving to ourselves and the world around us what is good, what is holy, what is just, what is acceptable what is perfect, what is mature, and what is the will of God. Because we will begin to see and understand the benefit of these sacrifices in our spiritual lives, and that will prove to us that God has been right all along, that we have deceived ourselves, and even more destructively, we have lied to ourselves. Where we once thought we were living, we now realize we were actually dead, And it is through the obedience unto the things of God that we actually become alive. But in the making of these sacrifices and the things that we are offering unto God now, let us not think too highly of ourselves. That's what he says in verse 3. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly, realizing that the very desire you have to be obedient to God comes from God himself. There's nothing in you that would cause you to want to be obedient to your new king that would cause you to want to live a life of sacrifice and self-denial. It's only the spirit of Christ that God the Almighty has placed within you. And that's why it's so important that our perception is changed. Not only our perception in how we see this world, but our perception in how we see God and how we see ourselves. And all three aspects are somewhat of a trinity in the way that we think. We must see the world differently. We must see God differently. And we must see ourselves differently. And if we can do this successfully, it will impact us at our very core. And so I think we can see from this passage that it's all about our perception. How do we see the sacrifice of Jesus? 
How do we see the pain and anguish that he endured on our behalf? How do we see the moment of our salvation when we escaped darkness and stepped into the light? How do we see our relationship with God, our standing with God? How do we see our mission on this earth now that we've been given the responsibility to represent him while we are here? Are we trapped under the allure of this world or can we rise above it and see the puppet master behind the scenes that is pulling the strings and orchestrating everything in absolute defiance against the God whom we serve? Friends, it is all about our perception. And I truly trust and pray that you are beginning to see with spiritual eyes. You are beginning to hear with spiritual ears. And that you'll not be caught unaware, but that you'll be alert. You will prove by the very way you live your life what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, friends, I love you. I'm so grateful again that you're with us today. And it is my prayer that your journey will truly be full of blessing and joy as you seek to serve the Lord with greater acts of service and sacrifice. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.